A warm welcome. I am Peter Sibiri and this is News Today. Today, we'll review the Greek sports and showbiz sectors. News Today is coming to you live from our Fun of studios at Koko Memle here in Accra. And we're live on DSTV Channel 41, Go TV Channel 144. This is the home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Now, here's another chilling account. He got shot in the stomach by suspected armed robbers, but managed to drive about four miles while bleeding to receive emergency care at the Konfonachi Teaching Hospital. This is the story of pharmacist Aaron Ohini Ajay, the CEO of Gelite uh, Chemists Limited, after his pharmacy was robbed by gunmen at a Greek Kumase in Kumase. The robbers made away with cash and mobile phones in the latest of attacks on pharmacies in some parts of the, of the country. Lava Frames, the Rasa Sari Donko has more. So that fateful evening, we are told that two men on a motorbike, one was waiting on the motorbike outside the shop here. The other one entered the shop with a firearm and asked all of them to lie down. So in here, with the CCTV footage you see, you can see some of the staff lying on the floor. But I have one of the ladies here uh, to tell us what actually happened within the shop. Mami, do you see your uncle? Do you see your uncle? Yes, I see your uncle. I see your uncle. I see your uncle. We had clothes and were looking up. Suddenly, a guy wearing a helmet entered. He asked all of us to lie down and gave a warning shot. He took the money from the mat and the pharmacy. When he stepped out, my brother who owns the shop shouted that he had been shot. Was shooting me, was shooting me. In the CCTV footage, you can see this lady also lying uh, on the ground. She will show me where she was lying. I lay right here. When he gave the warning shot, I tried hiding here. He shouted, Where is the money? I have not seen a gun before, so I was trembling. Within two minutes, he had made away with all we had. Within two minutes, the announcer said they were in Anomafako. As the gunman was leaving, he spotted Aaron in his car close to the shop. He shot him in the stomach and shot his tires as well. Bleeding profusely and in pain, he drove about four miles from Kumwase to the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital Emergency Center. He shares his story from his recovery bed. So I was wondering whether to speed off the scene or just remain calm for them to do their thing and go. He just got close to my window and shot through my passenger window. I realized I was shot. I put on my hazard lights and then started speeding towards Confanoche. I was bleeding heavily. The pain was there, but it got worse and worse as I got closer to the, to the hospital. Police are yet to effect any arrest or issue any official statement on the latest robbery. The incident comes in the wake of robbery attacks on pharmacies in parts of Accra. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Kromwase, Kumase, Ashanti region. The association wants the police to provide them with some protection or they'll be forced to shut down community pharmacies. Dr. Emmanuel K. Islander is president of the national chairman of the association. We are calling on the inspector general of police, Dr. George Akufo-Dampari, to instruct his men and women to, as a matter of urgency, investigate all reported cases of robbery against community pharmacists and pharmacies around the country. We have the data that I'll be showing 
sharing with you very soon. I must say that at this moment, we have served him with a letter. We've also served the Minister of Interior, and we've also served all MM DCAs through the local government service uh, service. And so we hope they have received it by now and they are aware of what we are talking about. We also call on the Inspector General of Police at the same time to provide security and patrol services to our community pharmacies across the country. And we, I must say, we are ready to collaborate with them to protect life and property. We are also calling on the regional, municipal, and district security councils to, as a matter of urgency, find a way to help keep our pharmacies safe. We are also appealing to the in in Minister for Interior, Honorable Ambrose Derry, to quickly intervene while calling on the law enforcement agencies for intervention, I would like to seize this opportunity to advise our, our community pharmacists around the country. Three persons have been arrested in connection with the clashes at Mam Ponton in the Quabre East Municipal District. Violence erupted in the town Monday night after youth groups from two electoral areas within the town clashed following an attack on a young man whom police say was robbed of his mobile phone on Christmas Eve. At least four people were injured as the rampaging youth destroyed some properties, forcing residents to flee for safety. Violence erupted in the town Monday night after youth groups from two electoral areas within the town clashed following an attack on a young man who police say was robbed of his mobile phone on Christmas Eve. At least four people were injured as a rampaging youth destroyed some properties forcing residents to flee for safety. The police were later called in to maintain law and order. They held talks with opinion leaders and urged the youth to remain calm. Security was later beefed up in the area following reports of fresh attack on a local mosque by some unknown persons. The police are, however, confirmed the arrest of three suspects. Chief Superintendent Stephen Kwasikwache is district commander. And uh, three of them are in custody. And we are still in position. First, uh, the victims have also been visited at the hospital. She herself can even bear us out. That when they come in, there's two therapies in town. And we are not withdrawing the men. And as I said, there are certain things we know even put it on air. Um, security matters is involved a lot. Um, the uniformed men are patrolling, as well as the CID men are also going around. At the Municipal Security Council meeting, BMC in the North Sesi Bebonsu said the council has put in place measures to ensure lasting peace in the area. of the conflicts and the situation is under control, that's what I tell you. And you can see the Zongo chief here, and then the appointing unit representative is also around. He came, and there's been a mutual agreement that we are all going to be peaceful. And we came to a conclusion that this is not an escalation between the Zongo youth and the Asante youth has been perceived out there. Some criminals the whole so we are going to arrest the corporates as the mother is standing beside me and on the way forward like we are saying I've asked them to form a WhatsApp platform about 10 people from the Zogo side 10 from the Santa side so that if there is any misunderstanding we, we, we solve it right off there so that they wouldn't be any escalations Reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. 
It is day number 364 in the year 2021, December 30th, which leaves us with one more day to round up this roller coaster of a year. We've seen extreme highs and extreme lows, but guess what? We have made it and are hoping for a great 2022. There is not over yet, good people, which gives us a chance to look back at all the things that happened, starting with a very important sector, agriculture. Now, we saw the African swine fever, there was also maize scarcity, fertilizer problems and others. And to help us dissect these and more via Zoom is Professor Edu, and he is an Greek uh, lecturer at KNUST. From food to the field, we'll dive right into the world of sports. CK Akono uh, got booted and fans witnessed the second coming, not of Jesus, but of Milovan. Hearts of Oak also won a lot of people's hearts by winning the Ghana Premier League. My colleague Muhtar Nabila will join me in studio with all the details. So stick and stay. We'll be back after this. You're still watching Joy News today with me, Mapita Sibili. Now we're taking a look at the agrig sector and how it has been during the year 2021. And joining me is Professor Albert Edu, who's an agrig economist and a agrig business management lecturer at uh, KNUST. Prof, thanks for making time for us. So, Prof, if you can hear me, please un un unmute yourself. Okay, Prof, it seems like we're having uh, some uh, problems uh, with uh, your sound. Uh, we'll try to rectify that very soon. That is uh, Professor Albert Edu, and he's an agric economist and a great business management uh, lecturer at KNUST. And we'll just be, you know, talking about the African swine uh, fever, which affected almost a thousand pigs in the country. We also had some uh, scarcity with maize. We'll talk about that. But while we're trying to rectify that sound problem, let's go to the North Dai, where the North Dai member of Parliament is uh, urging everyone to, you know, um, encourage in the uh, Bobobo. Thank you for staying with us. Now, in a review meeting with stakeholders, the REGSEC announced that persons who patronize any beach in Accra must show proof of vaccination or be willing to be vaccinated before gaining access to the shores. The regional minister, Henry Quarter, announced that officials of the Ghana Health Service and the police service will be there to enforce the new directives. Manuel Kranting joins us live with more. Manuel, what can you report? Manuel, it seems we're having problems with your sound, uh, but we'll get back to you. So now you can go to the beach, but you need to show your vaccination or proof of vaccination. If you're not vaccinated, then you have to be willing to be vaccinated uh, at the shores. Uh, so if you want to go to the beach and chill out, then this is the right time to get your vaccination. Let's go to Manuel Conting. Manuel, what can you report? Osman, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Great. So uh, I'm just saying that uh, in the past couple of minutes, uh, the, the regional security council of the Greater South East has reviewed its directive to ban uh, beach operations of, uh, within the region. Essentially, um, that was to put the link on the spikes that were being recorded in the country's active COVID-19 cases, um, especially with the highly transmissible and only variant. And so as the Christmas facility uh, heralded and, uh, you know, and um, got tightened, and um, there was a ban. 
but we have the South of Logan Nelson saying the Regional Security Council has to do that. And that ban has been lifted. While in place of that ban is a no vaccination, no empty policy. That is to the end that um, all uh, revelers who are, you know, uh, visiting the beaches now would have to take proof of vaccination um, at the entry point or would have to uh, undergo mandatory vaccination by office, uh, you know, officers of the Ghana Health Service who are told uh, will be deployed at, at the various entry points to all the beaches along the first coastline. So that is what we're going to have. But, um, I mean, uh, this, of course, has implications on the operations of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the beaches. And in the past couple of days that they were out of business, the beach officers said that this really has been biting on them uh, financially. And one of the reasons were told that was considered by the Regional Security Council um, in reviewing this particular plan was the economic impact um, on the operators. And um, Sam Okote is the uh, general manager of the La Pleasure Beach. And um, we're currently here uh, at the beach and just find out exactly what I'm, I'm sure that you'll be really excited about this new direction from the Regional Security Council. Yes, very, very excited. Because we have been suffering for long. So the first voter. The effect we have on the food. We can't tell. So when this one comes, we have a big fan. In fact, we are not happy at all. But today, we are not very I mean, the, the, the direction of like the ban was enforced for just a couple of days. I mean, how, how you know, impactful for just a couple of days of not of free? Very well, we have a, a great impact on the food. Because, like we are saying, this is far away from six months. And you just to meet and, and you just be called to meeting and say we should close the facility. Why people have purchased their items for the Christmas? So very, very disgusting. You don't understand it at all. But today, like I'm saying, we are very, very grateful to the minister. I want to understand the real impact. Tell me, in, in, in if you like, um, significant terms, in terms of what, monetary terms yes, or in terms yes. of items? In terms of monetary terms, because here yeah, we use VAT tickets. Okay. So the government will get its part. Uh, you know, people are buying drinks and vegetables so that we prepare. This, and the beach is basically about eating and drinking. Okay. But we collect, it's a toll collecting facility too. So while we have lost the toll collecting, we, we are, uh, the bar and the vendors too have lost their daily bread because they have to sell food to the customers. So all the things, as I'm talking to you, and some are spoiled. But we are very grateful to the uh, minister for giving us the opportunity. But, but, uh, how do you defend that? It's just been a couple of minutes since that ban was reviewed, and already, well, I see people um, who are at the beach now, they are, they are revelers, I see people horse riding and all of that. I mean, how do you defend that? You say you are not operating, but it seems you have, you've been operating all this while. We, we, we are not saying we are not operating. Even the minister knows that people used to come here more because the first directives that came, they say a uh, restaurant at beaches should open. That's why you can see that the place is, people are jumping to the place. So that one, they give us the orders that Restaurant at beaches to operate. Okay. So when you are seeing a uh, scene like this, it's not new. They know we have people have been trooping here small, small. Yes. So, so how do you enforce? Because you're being allowed now to operate, but on a condition that uh, people show proof of vaccination or are vaccinated at the entry point. How do you enforce that? They said we should contact the uh, Minister of Health Directorate so that they will bring their equipment from now to come to mount it at the gates. So anybody who comes in has not vaccinated, then they take the chance to vaccinate the person before you enter. Okay. That's why, that's what they said. Okay. Yes, yes. And so, I mean, beyond the Municipal Health Directorate mounting its uh, stand here, I mean, I, I see a lot of, you know, vendors, you know, paraded along this particular beach. Uh, how are you going to enforce that, make sure that As people- for that, when the president came out, to say that these places should be visited with vaccination cars. We make sure that all our workers, including the vendors and the waitresses and waitresses, we make sure that any time they come in, we inspect their vaccination car before they enter. We have been doing that before this closure to come. So as for that, we have been enforcing. But, but you are the head of security here. Uh, deputy head of security. Oh, tell me, so if somebody comes here, doesn't have a proof of vaccination, and is not willing to vaccinate also, what, what is going to happen? then we have to bounce you back. Okay. Uh, the directives from the regional minister is that the police should assist us to make sure all the protocols are adhered to. 
So uh, we will liaison with the La police uh, 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 command to, to help us do the job. We cannot do it alone. Although we have internal security also to enforce whatever we have to tell them, uh, we, are, we also rely on the police. We have the marine police also coming here. So I believe uh, together we can do a very good job. Okay, grateful. And so um, these are the managers of the um, La Pleasure Beach just speaking to us, um, reacting to that uh, ban which has now been lifted uh, here and allowing them to now freely operate on the condition of uh, you know, making sure that people are vaccinated before they are given access here. So, um, uh, maps, as you can see, already activities are beginning to pick up um, here at the uh, La Pleasure Beach and quite the same fashion in um, the other beaches. And so we'll, we'll be trying to you know, visit a couple of the others and get a reaction uh, for you. But for, for now, uh, maps, the operators are excited about the directive and they say it's welcome news. All right, thank you very much, Manuel Kranting. We'll be waiting for the rest of the stories you'll get from the rest of the beaches. Away from that, let's talk sports. And for sports, 2021 can be described as dramatic. From the football field to the tartan tracks, sports had a year to remember. The year began with the Black Satellites winning the under-20 African Cup of Nations in Mauritania, but ended disappointingly as Richard Kome lost a potential world title fight against Vasily. Though Samuel Techi won Ghana's first Olympic medal in 29 years, many good stories did not emerge from the discipline as football took the attention with the sacking of C.K. Akono and the hiring of Milovan in September. Now, who could have thought, how, who could have thought South Africa dragged uh, Ghana's image in the mud with alleged mass fixing allegations and government committing a $25 million into Black Stars for next year's tournament? Well, uh, Joy Sports with Tao Nabila Abdullah joins me for us to take a look at what happened in the world of sports because you're the man who knows it all, the man who breaks all the stories, <laughs> the big stories in the world of uh, sports. Now, uh, Muftar, let's start with the Black Satellites winning the AFCON Under-20. And just take us through, uh, give us a little bit of a playback for that. Well, um, that was one thing many of us never expected. Considering the success of the team in the waffle competition, uh, many had questioned the caliber of players that were selected by the technical team led by Abdul Karim Zito. So when they went to the competition and made it to the grand finale, mm -hmm. uh, many were not optimistic of the, the team's ability to win because of the opponents they were going to face, which was Uganda. Mm. Uganda had been dominant from the group stages. The satellites had struggled from the group stages. But when it mattered most, uh, the likes of Daniel Afriye Banya of Accra House of Oak, Abdul Fattah Isahaku, and co rose to the occasion, and Ghana won the uh, the competition. This was the first time since 2009 mm -hmm. when they went and won the competition in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a success that uh, Keto Kweko and his team will look back and say that 2021 was a year that set the tone uh, for Ghana yeah. in terms of their vision for Ghana football because uh, according to Keto Kweko, one of the things he wants to do is to build formidable winning teams for the country and if you have teams that are able to win from the youth level you imbued in the players the winning mentality, and that could translate into the senior national team as we head into the 2021 African Cup of Nations. Okay, well, another thing that really got a lot of people excited, except for me, because me, I'm a Kotoko fan, do you know that? I know. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Did Lister well tell you that? <laughs> well, uh, maybe not Lister well, but yourself. <laughs> All right, yeah, but Heart of Oak winning the really? Premier League. Yeah. And that is what, in 11 years? Yes, first time in 11 years. First time in 11 years. Tell us actually, about that. Uh -huh. Actually, um, if you want to take the mathematics, you would say that it was the first time in eight years because 2018, the season did not complete. Yeah. 2019, there was no football because we were under normalization. So if we take out those two years, we say, oh, maybe nine years or so before has a won the league title. But you can still say that the last time they won the league title was in 2009. Yeah. And for them to win it in 2021 uh, shows that yeah, it actually took them about 11 years to win it. Uh, but you would like to appreciate the success of House of Oak mm -hmm. from the genesis of how their season started. It started woefully. Yeah. Their first game uh, against uh, Ashanti Gold had to be cancelled because of COVID issues. Then their second game had to come up against Adriana Stars, where unfortunately 
they lost out in that, in that fixture. They came up against uh, Ash Gold. They drew 2-2 two -two at the Accra Sporting, which was arguably their best game so far. Management had to replace then coach Emmanuel New Odu mm -hmm. and, replace, uh, and, and brought in Costa Papic. Costa Papic was a man many thought would come and uh, uh, settle the ship of House of Oak. Unfortunately, it didn't go well as he had to leave with many players alleging that uh, he had his preferred choice of players to... to to f uh, select for matches. Yeah. And this led to the man also moving away from the job abruptly. He had come in less than three months. He left the job. They had to bring in a stopgap coach in New Noyen who is in charge of their junior side. He came in and led them in their game against uh, Asante Kodoko, which was the first round of the season, yeah. before they brought in this man, uh -huh. Samuel Bodu. And um, he became the man they say, Kofi Yesu. Yeah. He stepped into the shoes and uh, led uh, the Phobians to win the league title. After that win over uh, Asante Kotoko at the Accra Sports Stadium, somewhere June 27, if my memory serves me right, it set the tone for Hearts of Oak to win the league title. And we cannot forget that when they won the league title, it also set the tone for them to win the FA Cup as well, mm -hmm. because this was a competition they have labored so hard to win. And they won that one too for the first time in 21 years. In 21 years. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about investment and investing into the um, Black Stars. Yes. Right, so while corporate Ghana is being asked to raise about what, 25 million, million uh, US dollars. But you know that the national elephant of Guinea, yeah. you know, the interim president yeah. was like, you have to. <laughs> You, you, bring have, the trophy, you bring the trophy or, or you return the money that we invested. invested in you. Uh, is uh, President Akufado saying anything like that? Or we're just giving the Black Stars 25 million US dollars? I, I don't think this story was... Um, it's quite difficult to actually put the narration there because uh -huh. I know the person who prepared the document yeah. where it was presented to the Jubilee House. Yeah. The communique, first of all, did not come out right because the plan for the 25 million dollars is not just for the black stars okay it's for the general sport in the country okay so commonwealth games 2022 is okay. in the olympic games everything they had a general plan mm -hmm. for sports in the country however when the communique came out they said 25 million dollars for african cup of nations and the world cup so we take the president's word for it and go by what the president said mm -hmm. we've been made to understand that the corporate institutions have uh, committed two million dollars okay so far, government also set aside $10 million. Mm -hmm. So what it means is that the corporate institutions were supposed to raise uh, $15 million for us. And now we have $12 million. It means okay. that we still have $13 million more, uh, $13 million more, more to, to raise meet the, the, 25 million. The, the, yeah, the $25 million budget the Ministry of Youth and Sport presented to the mm -hmm. Jubilee House. And uh, at this point, it's really difficult to tell because following the meetings that transpired, the first meeting... There were people who committed about 9 million Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. Most of the, some, some of the companies that came in, they gave their word that they were going to commit one, uh, 9 million Ghana cities. I'm aware of a company that had also told the government that they were willing to take up the cost of financing the Black Stars yeah. and paying the Black Stars coach and all that. Those documents are yet to be signed. If this contract is signed, we can guarantee that, oh, we now have th uh, $3 million and we need $12 million more. For the next edition of the African Cup of Nations, what sources have told us is that government have a, a planned budget okay. of $5 million yeah. for the African Cup of Nations. But the World Cup 2, they have another planned budget of $5 million. Okay. But you and I know. For a World Cup, we cannot do $5 million. So, so what, what, what are we looking at? $5 million, if not $5 million, is it 10? The last World Cup which was 2014 World Cup Ghana participated, yeah. we had about $90 million. $90 million. So if we are going to 2022 World Cup, do With the five. mathematics yourself. Yeah. Just do the mathematics yourself. The figure will shoot up. The figure will probably shoot Definitely up. Definitely will okay. shoot up. Uh, now, uh, Uncle Sika Kono <laughs> got booted. <laughs> yes, he yeah. was attacked. I give you the biggest story in, uh -huh. the, in the football calendar. Yeah. Um, Joy Sports once again led that story. Led by Mokhtar. Uh, 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 yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm giving you credit. Oh. Yours truly. Uh -huh. Though politicians did not agree with the decision of the Ghana Football Association yeah. to sack him, the FA had to make a compelling case that he didn't have to let go of Melo. And interestingly, it was after a game against South Africa yeah. in, in Johannesburg, where yeah. Ghana lost that game, where one goal to zero where the Ghana Football Association felt that at that point it was really difficult for Ghana to qualify if there was no changes in the technical direction. But if, even prior to this, there were a lot of 
issues between the technical team led by Milo, uh, uh, CK Akono and mm -hmm. the leadership of the Ghana Football Association, where they had even tried sacking him three times without success That's because yeah. he had that political backing. But when it mattered most, they went to the Jubilee House. They had to make a compelling case and even told the Jubilee House that this point, we don't have any local coach who can lead the Black Stars. So Jubilee House gave them the green light to hire an expatriate. Then they had to start working. They started working around the clock. CK Akuno was sacked on the 13th. Yeah. On the 14th, Joyce Post reported that uh, the FA were considering Milovan Rivat. On the 15th, we laid our fingers on the document yeah. or the contract they were preparing for uh, Milovan Rivat to come back. They prepared the, doc uh, the contract on the 15th. His work began on the 19th of September. So within the space of a week or seven days, they had already gotten a replacement, but they announced him as the, the Black Stars coach on September 24 yeah. to come back and take over the, the leadership of the technical team of the Black Stars. And when he took over, uh, many say um, there's Milo in the Black Stars. I'm uh, your friend saying uh, 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 Black Stars, I have no. I have no. Black Stars, I have Oh, okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, say why? You. All right. Okay, so now uh, the last one the South yeah. Africa reporting <sighs> Ghana to FIFA <sighs> and that whole Bruhaha. What, Tale? So, what's in conclusion? The crowd kind of saying. <laughs> in conclusion, uh -huh. Ghana, you cheated us. So, FIFA, investigate Ghana. Okay. But FIFA said um, South Africa's report was inadmissible. Okay. Because it did not meet the requirements of it, specifically Article 14 of the World Cup regulations. Okay. Article 46 of how to file a protest. So okay. uh, the protest that was filed by South Africa was incompetent in the eyes of the National Committee of FIFA, mm -hmm. so they rejected it. Once again, uh, Joyce Sports led that story. <laughs> and interestingly, we, mm -hmm. we had an email coming from FIFA, FIFA telling us that they were going to investigate the matter and all that. And mm -hmm. later, they sent us an email, email that the, the, the petition that was filed by South Africa was inadmissible and, it, and that they had rejected it. But one clear thing that everyone needs to understand is that the image of Ghana football was dragged in the mouth. Yeah. That was what led to the FA president getting furious and reacting to some of the things that yeah. Danny Jordan, the president of SAFA, had said. He actually claimed that if Ghana fails to qualify for the World Cup 2022, yeah. the economy will be so hard that even the president of the land would suffer. So that was what led to the GFA to react to all but, these but things. But have we had uh, any um, case like this and they actually won? Yes, uh, there was one, uh, South Africa versus Senegal, 2016. Uh -huh. That game was November 12th, in my memory serves 2016. It was uh -huh. officiated by a Ghanaian referee, Joe okay. Olamte. Uh -huh. um, in that one, it was Senegal who filed a protest. They said that in some moments of the game, especially in minute 42 and 44, yeah. he took decisions that changed the outcome of the game, that changed the complexity of the game, and they decided to report to FIFA. So the match was fully investigated. Joe Olamte was banned for life. Yeah. The match was replaced. Senegal won and qualified for the 2018 FIFA World Cup. So South Africa actually thought yeah. if they take such a, uh, such a step, there was a possibility of getting FIFA okay. to order a oh, replay okay. of the game and all that. But DS never worked out because their protest was deemed incompetent. All right. Right. Thank you very much, Muftal. Uh, it's from what? What minute? Forty second to forty eight. <laughs> to forty fourth minute. <laughs> to forty fourth minute. Yes. I, I love that. That yeah. is fantastic. Thank you very much for, Thanks for that uh, sports review. Now let's talk about the most important uh, sector, which is a Greek and Professor Albert Edu is an a Greek economist and a Greek business management lecturer at KNUST, and he joins me to dissect some of. These are uh, Greek stories. Prof, thanks so much for making time once again. Thank you very much, my people. All right, now let's talk about the African uh, swine fever, which affected almost a thousand pigs across the country. Yes, I think that was one of the uh, low points in the agricultural sector for the year under review. Uh, it's quite a dangerous disease, a viral disease that has no cure as we speak. Yeah. And it's spread across the country. Now, you would have noticed that a number of the youth have developed interest in swine production or pig production. Yeah. And so they started trying to earn a living from this enterprise. And when they were hit by this disease, it was quite a devastating blow. And I think that going forward, we have to 
try and look for insurance packages for some of these uh, young people so that when some of these things happen, yeah. they don't lose their investment and then the agriculture sector in general doesn't also suffer. So now going to 2022, what are like two lessons we've learned from this so that if it happens again, what are some of the measures we'll take? Uh, like I said, because the disease that one cannot control, we have to rather look at preventive measures. Okay. And then one of the most important ways of trying to minimize the risk that you face is to maybe call for an agricultural insurance scheme that will now uh, have a product that some of these farmers can buy. And therefore, when something like this happens, then they can have some compensation yeah. to take care of the challenge that they have faced. Uh, it's also something that I think government will have to pay close attention to. Our friends in the Veterinary Services Division should pay close attention to. We should educate our farmers more okay. so that they know what to do in order to prevent some of these things from happening. When the outbreak of case, they are supposed to uh, separate those that are sick from the rest so that we don't transport animals from one pen to the other in order to spread it. Yeah. So I think a lot of education going into the next year will also help us to minimize the risk of this particular disease. All right. So now from the uh, African fever, uh, let's talk about maize uh, scarcity. I mean, that was quite a, a huge problem because it also affected uh, the cost of poultry feed. But let's talk about, let's start with the maize uh, scarcity. Yes, maize, maize was also um, badly affected. And as you would know, maize is a major, major staple crop in the country. And yeah. almost all the food that we eat in our home, maize is a key ingredient. And so it was affected badly. It just exposed how vulnerable our agricultural system is to the risk of climate change and weather variability. And so because we had poor rainfall, and then uh, we also had issues with fertilizers, delaying, and all that, the, the, the end result was that the quantity we were supposed to harvest, we could not harvest that. And then, like you rightly pointed out, it has repercussions for the animal production sector as yeah. well. You see, maize is a major ingredient in the feed of farm animals, poultry sector. And so nowadays, you go to the market and you see that the prices of eggs have gone up, the prices of meat have gone up, all because the major ingredient that constitutes their feed, yeah. the price has also risen. And so I think that maize gives us a key lesson going into 2022 that government really has to set up when we are talking about irrigation infrastructure we have to be more serious about it yeah. so that we don't depend overly on the natural weather again if we have to put things in place so that all the fertilizers that we want to procure come in good time let us do all those grounds work because when you have bottlenecks along the input supply chain, then you are likely to see some of the things that we are seeing. Mm. So I think government has to really learn serious lessons from the main episode. All right. So now I have a farmer friend and his name is Jay. And Jay this whole year was, you know, just complaining about the high cost of poultry feed. He had to use most of his savings uh, to feed his uh, poultry and also of the bird flu that in, uh, impacted the poultry industry. And it almost made it collapse. Firstly, the high cost of poultry feed. Looking at 2022, what is the projected outlook when it comes to the cost? Yes, unfortunately, um, we cannot predict the weather pattern correctly uh, because of um, maybe, let's say, the, the unreliable nature of the, of the weather. Climate change generally is, is, is affecting everything. So our weather friends are supposed to also help us do a good job so that we can predict. Yeah. Now, going to the future, it is still going to be difficult because we don't know yet. We haven't entered 2022. We don't know whether the weather patterns are going to be better than we had in 2021. And so let's just pray. But like I said, government cannot be praying. Our farmers can be praying for good rains, but government should be planning towards putting in place more scale irrigation infrastructure so that 
when there is no rain from God, yeah. at least we can take advantage of the of the dams around so that we can irrigate our farm, grow our maize, and get a lot of maize onto the market. When we have maize onto the market, we will be able to supply the poultry farmers so that they can bring down the cost of feed. When the cost of feed comes down, the egg price will come down, and then the price of the meat will also come down, and everyone will be okay. Yeah. And so we, we are calling for pragmatic measures. We cannot throw up our hands in the air, yeah. just like the farmers are doing. They don't have the capacity, but as a state, we have the budget, we have the capacity, and we have to plan so that we don't go through the same cycle next year. Okay. Now, COVID came and it destroyed a lot of things. Uh, places were shut, borders were also uh, locked. But as things started to open up, you know, the air borders, the land borders remained closed. Yeah. And now there were issues about Ghana still importing tomatoes from Burkina Faso. For example, yesterday I wanted to do some uh, New Year lunch shopping. And I went to three shopping markets or supermarkets and I couldn't find tomatoes. So what's the whole issue with that? What's happening with, with, with that uh, particular uh, problem? Yes, yeah, so uh, COVID affected almost every sector of the Ghanaian economy, but the economy of the world at large. Fortunately for us, the agricultural sector was quite strong, quite resilient. And so uh, it was not badly affected as other sectors were affected. Nevertheless, you are right in pointing out that once the borders were closed, then all the tomatoes that we get from Burkina Faso, you are not going to get them in the quantities that we are used to. Nevertheless, a few track loads still find their way here. How they get in, that's why your guess is as good as mine. But you are right. If the borders continue to be closed, we are protecting life and we are also protecting livelihood. Those women who depend on the tomato tree those who go to Burkina Faso to bring the tomato to Ghana for us to get some to buy, their businesses are also going to suffer. Again, we have a lot of yam that also travel from Ghana to the Sahelian region. We have also traders who go there to bring cow tea. And so we trade with Mali, we trade with Burkina Faso, we trade with Togo. And so maybe because of Omicron and the new variants, uh, we can understand the position of government. But going forward, when the things of size a bit, I would encourage that we partially open the border to allow food to flow in. I know the original lockdown did not uh, include food commodities. If you were moving food commodities from one region to the other, you were allowed because people were going to depend on the food. I hope that the same thing will be brought to bear on the, the closure of the border so that there will be some trade among these neighboring countries so that our farmers can also benefit, our traders can also have some livelihood. All right. So, I mean, you know, government had always mentioned that Ghana was self-sufficient. Uh, we can always do it ourselves. But it turned out that was not true. <laughs> Uh, when we say we are self-sufficient in food production, we produce so many crops. Yeah. We produce a number of animals. So you can be self-sufficient in the production of a particular food commodity, and then you can be relying heavily on import for another food commodity. Over the years, we have heavily relied on rice import. We have heavily relied on importation of poultry products. But Overall, when you look at the larger picture, then you see that we are able to produce more of the staple. So our cassava, our yam, yeah. our plantain, those ones, we can produce what our people require for their sustenance. And so when government says that, one can understand them. Mm -hmm. But there are certain commodities that we are unable to produce what we need. And that is why we have been exposed. And let me also make it clear that in the agricultural sector, risk is so inherent, it's so common. And so this year, you might be self-sufficient in one commodity. A particular risk can strike, and then you fall into a situation of vulnerability. 
And so the self-sufficiency is not something that is going to last for a long period. You mm. need to manage it year after year so that your people will have food to eat and will not go hungry when there's some small volatility in some of the variables that we, we cannot control. All right, now before I let you go, uh, let's talk about the Planting for Food and Jobs program. 2021, how did that go for us? Unfortunately, 2021, I think PFJ, Planting for Food and Jobs, had a lot of negative uh, reportage because of the delay in the supply of the fertilizer. And that is why earlier on I made a point that if those in the ministry yeah. uh, will set up and plan ahead of time so that if they have to place the order, they place them ahead of time so that we get them in. Remember that farming is time-bound. Yeah. If you have to plan, you have to plan at a particular time. If you have to apply fertilizer, it must be applied at a particular time. You cannot bring in fertilizer at a later period and expect that you get the same result. Mm. And so once we are going to expend a lot of money to bring in these things, let's do all the legwork right so that we can bring in the volume at the right time. Yeah. Then the farmers who are benefiting from PSG will get these fertilizers in good time. Okay. Apart from bringing it in, there are some problems internally in the supply chain. And I think government will have to maybe get some experts or get some security guys to try and go through the system and try to identify those who are hijacking the system. Okay. Sometimes the fertilizer will be there, but there's some artificial shortage within the system and farmers struggle to be able to have access to it. If these things continue, you will spend money on this input, but they will not translate into the high yield that we are expecting. So going into 2022, my hope is that the ministry will set up, get a technical team, get some security guys to disguise themselves and go through the system and fish out some of the guys who are sabotaging the system so that we can deal with them so that there will be flow of input throughout the system and then the agriculture sector will flourish as we all expect it to. All right. Professor, thank you so much for all of that. And I wish you a fantastic uh, agriculture year for the year 2022. And thank you very much. My pizza is too good. Thank you very much. And that is where we end Draw News today with me, my pizza CBD. You know you can join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are Draw News on TV. The Marketplace is next.